Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Art Fight Podcast. Here we are, episode 102. Uh, is this it, week is it 102? Yeah, 101. We did 100 and had a big party. Oh, then gosh, we had, you're right. Then we had our uh, our friends on last week um, to talk about um, the uh, the upcoming art project at the uh, Barbershop Theater. I and, just totally, uh, I'm sorry. I just totally botched your introduction. Please carry on. That's I okay. Just, Here, we are, Here we are, Brian. Here we are with co-host Brian. So uh, it's just us this week. It sounds like it's probably good. Sounds like we're a little bit scattered. <laughs> Might be easier just to keep track of one another. Um, but yeah, it's our 102nd uh, episode. I'll, I'll soon lose track of this, but we're so close to 100. I feel like I can count to two. And uh, that's so far so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so we, we're still kind of on the high from episode 100, which was exciting. And we had so many cool special guests and uh, one of the nicest uh, things I heard back from that from one of the guests was basically that it just sounded like or it just felt like uh, hanging out with friends, you know, and it just was a cool thing to have people from all over connected and talking uh, combat sports, writing and yeah. fighting and all those those creative uh, people from from that side of our our sort of our business. Yeah, but, it's uh, fun, too, because I, I feel like it's it's the kind of hang we might have done anyway, like even though we're all meeting remotely and all this stuff because of, you know, ongoing lockdowns and everything else. Um, uh, you know, the fact is, is, you know, uh, us and all those guests were located all over the United States and even down in Brazil. So it's kind of one of those things where that's the only way we could have pulled it off anyway. So it was sort of like oddly felt very normal. So I, I appreciated that. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, last week was the first time we had two people in the same frame and that worked out really well. So consolidation of humans yeah. on the screen. Uh, cool. and, and I learned a lot about, uh, their, their, uh, Mercury chamber, uh, project, which is super exciting. And, and I can't, when does that kick off here? Like in a week or so? Uh, yeah, it's coming up soon. And if, if you go back, anybody who's listening, if you go back, uh, uh, on our page at, uh, artfightpodcast.com and look at last week's episode, you can find uh, links and stuff where you can see their, um, I guess it's an Indiegogo. Is that right? Not a Kickstarter, yeah. uh, but they have a, a fundraiser going to help, uh, keep that, uh, that event affordable, um, a really cool art installation, uh, interactive space, which is something most people aren't doing nowadays, but they've got a venue and a schedule set up where they're going to be able to, you know, have a few people at a time, uh, going through this, uh, this art installation. So it's, it's kind of cool. Like we talked about last week, it's, it's, something I appreciate because it's somebody, you know, sort of moving in the other direction, the whole art world's, you know, streaming to get streaming, you know, just as quick as they can finding every alternative to uh, IRL art. And, uh, and here these two kids are like, nah, we're just going to make it real and uh, keep it safe. And I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, um, I think everybody's going to have a, a different, uh, I feel like people are primed pretty well to interpret art in physical spaces in a new way, uh, mm -hmm. whether they like it or not. And for a long time coming after this, you know, it's like, um, you know, when, when you ponder how many of your sensibilities are just being sort of altered, you know, like, uh, I'm sure you've had this feeling when you're watching an old movie or a TV show or something and, and you can't help but look at it through the lens of the pandemic and, and think about how I wouldn't, that would not happen now. Or I feel anxious because they're so like close to each other or, you know, there's any number, right. of, any number of uh, sort of uh, disconnects, you know, that just uh, it's going to take time to sort of sort out, I think how that looks and feels, you know, it's kind of like, um, it's almost like, like you ever watched like an old Seinfeld rerun, at, you know, obviously rerun, but if you ever watch an old Seinfeld and, <laughs> and, uh, and you just realize that most of their plot lines would not work out in the age of cell phones. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've thought about that too. Yeah. Like where if they could have just, if you could just pulled a phone out of your pocket and made a quick call to George, you know, he might still be married to Susan. Who knows? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe it's right. for the best, right? E An email would have kept him from, uh, Evites would have kept him from licking all those envelopes or her from licking all those envelopes. Yeah, I they mean, killed her. Yeah. You know, any number of things might have been. It's actually interesting. You could you could probably make a fun project and just actually go through the series and yeah. and see 
how quickly just the, the, the a cell phone or an internet connection would have made it simpler. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty much most things. Yeah. Did they even have, did they have an, did they ever reference, did they have the internet during the Seinfeld series? It, Cause they must've right at some point, but they never had it on the show. It was just, well, that was, or it was just sort of relegated to like, you know, no one ever thought send a quick email or whatever. <laughs> yeah, like in, in the later parts of the Seinfeld stuff, you can you, you can see the Apple computer on his not the little you know the the two E or whatever it is two okay. C or two okay. E or whatever it was uh, on his desk. But that's like you know when the screen was like this big and yeah, inter internet was sort of like an event to try to get connected and and do anything with it. So yeah, uh, but certainly just like being able to make a phone call or send a text message would have no negated the entire show. I know all of a sudden, you know, the, the Chinese restaurant, I mean, all that stuff would have gone differently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I can't help but think about that with uh, respect to just any sweeping sort of changes of context and how, you know, I, I wonder if a child now that's, you know, uh, fully immersed in of technology if they watch Seinfeld and they just can't, can't even uh, find it, they've probably, maybe they find it so frustrating because it's like, this is a, an invalid plot, right? Like this does not. Oh yeah. This they doesn't... can't, this can't bring themselves to, to the disbelief is too much to ask. Yeah. And, I mean, every, <laughs> or, or just, it's not even necessarily disbelief, but just sort of, you're probably asking so, a young person to connect uh, things in their, in their brain that where it's just, they're like, I, I can't, I don't know. I just, I don't know. Right. Like, you know, or it's like watching a Tarkovsky film or something. It's like, you know, you're like, uh, even like, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, like Bergman, even like, you know, uh, where you've got like these medieval scenes, you know, where they, they're so slow and serene. Cause they're actually like, this is how life actually was back then. It was this slow and this, this, you know, it literally was made up of still lives because there was nowhere to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and, um, uh, and I think that's, so it's, you know, like those movies you appreciate because they're, because they're actually somewhat otherworldly seeming, you know what I mean? Um, uh, and now it's just a, a, you know, a Larry David script. Um, but, <laughs> Uh, but, but, you know, speaking of other worlds and all this stuff, we wanted to get into, uh, 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 you know, the art part of our discussion for this week. And, uh, that was like a clumsy, you know, segue, but here we go. Stumbling into it, Brian, there's a, uh, uh, piece in art review that I read, uh, by a guy named Martin Herbert. And it's, uh, an opinion piece where he talks about like, essentially like what, you know, now that we're all kind of at least considering the possibility of what's going to happen when we, uh you know, when we're able to get back to like in real life art events and things like this, you know, he's saying, but you know, why is it that, you know, you know, essentially like now that we've had a chance to take a break from it, why doesn't anybody really care? <laughs> essentially that's kind of yeah. the gist of what the opinion is. And he yeah. talks about how the art world went from being a place where, the actual art and the sort of evolution of art and the changing styles over time and stuff would sort of be the thing that would drive the, the momentum, you know, through the given, through the yearly calendar where it'd be like, okay, well in, in springtime, this sort of thing was happening. And, you know, by fall, we're either going to see more better, you know, sort of representations of that, or we're going to see a, a you know, the pendulum swing back the other way and things are going to become abstract again, or all of a sudden, like now, now sculpture is the big thing, that sort of thing. We have styles and trends that sort of drive the calendar forward. Mm -hmm. But he talked about how, how the art world had gotten to a place where that was even sort of secondary. If I read it correctly, even that had become sort of secondary to just this sort of observation of the workings of the infrastructure of the art world where it's like, okay, well in the springtime, you know, we go, do the small gallery scene. Cause that's when they do these kinds of events. But you know, by the time fall comes around, you know, there's going to be another biennial and don't forget to get ready for the Miami in the winter, <laughs> you know? So it yeah. sort of turned into a thing that had, you know, infrastructural sort of like schedule built into yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but at the end of it all, he sort of leaves the whole, the whole piece on, on, uh, um, 
on sort of an interesting note. <laughs> I think I just clicked off of it. Uh, but he says, uh, what's the last line there? He says, uh, yeah, if you just stop it there. He says, but that was somewhat the case before the shutdown. In this sense, as it has done with so many other things, the pandemic has only illuminated what was already awry. Any potential reconstruction at whatever scale has to take that into account. The art world has lately gotten very good at perpetual motion and meanwhile forgotten about traction. And and to me, that's a, that's a great ending yeah. line. I love that. I love the way he really landed it, uh, at, at the end there. And and it's a really good point that you know that you've you've sort of created a cultural uh, environment, you know, that has this sort of uh, built-in sort of progress motion, you know, that you can sort of you know, uh, you know, sort of go through the ritual of or whatever, but yeah. at the same time, it's sort of like, where is like the deeper meaning? And especially too, now that we're going to be coming out of a world that just had a global pandemic, we're going to be coming, you know, in the midst of a world that's having, at least in America, especially, uh, it's not just America, but certainly in America, we are in the middle of, you know, uh, a lot of social upheaval right now, an election year on top of that. Um, and in places like Nashville, you know, we, we just had a tornado. There's a hurricane hitting Louisiana as we speak. You know, there's wildfires out west, you know, uh, there could be an asteroid coming in from what I understand. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with very deep questions and crises at this point. And, and won't the art world have to be something that responds to that, you know? And I think the art world is something that's responding to that, but, but we're talking about the greater art world. You know what I mean? Will the, you know, will the, the art world of New York, Los Angeles and Miami, um, you know, will they try to just continue with their trendy sales or will they, um, actually embrace, you know, deeper, uh, deeper messaging and things when it comes to actually responding to what's happening in the world around us. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, there's so much in all that, but yeah, yeah. so it's a lot to talk about. Uh, there is, and we sort still of, need to talk about Robbie Lawler. <laughs> so. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, I think there is just an incredible amount of compression and sort of a sorting out that is happening, but um, it's, it depends on sort of the, the level of authenticity of the entity of which is being sort of compressed or the challenge that's being made. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, uh, you know, maybe traditional things like Art Basel or something are going to take on another dimension or another, you know, as opposed to just kind of being like a, I'm not saying it's not legitimate, but it's just kind of a hang, you know, or whatever. It's a social thing. It's mm -hmm. a networking thing. It's a, it's like a a county fair, you know, or whatever. So and yeah. that's part of the spirit of what it should be, but yeah, it's a bizarre, yeah, it's a market. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so there's, there's those kind of things, but then I guess I just wonder under this kind of more of a, a situation of kind of duress, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if, if that's going to forge, uh, either like sort of, a, you know, like a sense of responsibility or like, are, are people going to, you know, cause I, there's a lot of people that I think are even now just saying I've never even used social media as a platform to speak what I'm thinking, but I'm doing, right. I'm doing that now. So I think that any of these institutions or tools or uh, normalities or whatever that we all have, everybody's being faced with uh, this kind of auditing of your life uh, and auditing of your surroundings and auditing of probably, you know, people and relationships and jobs and family situations and where you want to live, you know, and, you know, in Nashville right now, we've got, uh, what, there was a, an article the other day that said that um, the number one place that people are moving, you know, there's this exodus, right? It's happening from LA and New York and a lot of these bigger <clears throat> uh, cities. And Nashville was said to be ranked as number one place that people are moving to from New York right now. Oh God. Right. <laughs> God. So, so what's, we keep on, we've got a, we've got a house uh, for rent right across the street from us. And unfortunately, like we, we, we sort of really, uh, we, we really liked the people who used to live across the street, although we moved in like four weeks before the pandemic happened. So we really never even got to meet yeah. them other than like wave across the street and say hello. Yeah. Uh, but they moved away. And so now we we've turned into uh, we're like, 
very, very scoped in on who's going to move in across the street because people keep coming and going and we're like, are, are they the new people or are they just the old it's, people? And how come so many people are coming by? Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and, so, right. And why does that matter more? Right. Because you're not just running around like a crazy person like you were before, you know? So yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's like, wait, this person sleeps, you know, 30 yards from my bedroom. So I didn't know what right. the hell is going on. But right, uh, exactly. but by the way, just uh, to, to speak to the 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 facts here, uh, it was probably three or four days after uh, I saw that article, um, and it and then uh, two doors down from me, uh, people from New York just moved here, just like yesterday or day before. So wow. Uh, but it's an interesting, funny thing. Set here. your watch by Brian. Set your watch. By. I know, right? Well, I mean, I, I've been one of those people, but I went there and came back. It wasn't like. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, everybody's kind of passing through there ultimately. And, you know, I can see, I mean, I can tell you right now, I don't care what I was doing in New York, man. If, if all this shit was going on, I would be like, yeah, okay. You know, but I've got friends in LA that are coming out here and looking at, you know, farmland, you know, and mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, everybody's sort of reevaluating everything. So I guess to sort of bring it back into the, to all this, you know, I think that, um, everything has to be looked at anew in some sort of way. And we don't have a way to define that really yet or a matrix to sort of evaluate or put that through. But it, mm -hmm. but it is, I think, uh, 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 really uh, an inevitable set of choices that, that everybody's gonna have to make. But it's also kind of a weird thing because as much as things change, they stay the same, right? You don't want to be so uh reactionary about everything that like everything has to be completely rethought from the ground up maybe not right maybe it's just a right. small adjustment here or maybe it's just a a little bit of the directionality of the project you're working on that you need to get yeah. kind of modulated yeah. a little bit you know so it's a weird right. it's a weird thing like yes everything's in question it doesn't mean that everything has to be fully questioned or 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 rethought completely yeah, no, no. And and also too, there's different sort of motivations between some of these things. You know, I think I think um, you know, for instance, you know, the I mean, the art world's been talking about being a more inclusive place for the last 20 years or more. Um, but it's it's especially in the last 10, I would say, that you've seen more and more of that and and honestly, you if you want to see that in action, you really need to look at like artist run spaces and small galleries and things like that. Cause that's where you see it the most. I think that, you know, in Nashville, there are some institutions that have really made a lot of progress with that. But generally speaking, the smaller, the smaller boats have been much better at responding, you know, to, to that need and that desire to sort of, you know, have, have more different voices on the walls and in the halls. And, um, uh, and I think, um, I think that will continue. You know, I mean, I think again, you know, when we come out of this, it's going to, I mean, even in the middle of all this stuff, I think it's the smaller galleries that have really kind of led the way and the individual artist studio practices and stuff that have like, were the quickest to adapt and the most creative in the way that they adapted. You know, I've talked before on the show about the Nashville uh, gallery associations, virtual art crawl video where they basically just got all the galleries to create videos when they opened up their new shows on the first Saturday of the month. And then they put those all together into one video. You could watch at one centralized YouTube channel. Yeah. And, um, and that was all smart and that was all cool, but it, it's, it, it, it's important to note that the best version of that yet was one where it seemed like the galleries had quickly run out of ideas two or three weeks in and nearly every gallery essentially had just obviously had just said to the artists, just do what you want to do. And then we'll submit that as our part of the, the thing. And it's, and once they gave it over to the artists, it was like twice or three times as good. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's like the smaller you get, like the closer you get to the art itself and the smaller you stay, the, the, the more responsive and the more dynamic it's always going to be. You know what I mean? So I think that trend will continue. You'll still see that whatever we're going to be coming out of this, watch that, watch the, watch the galleries, watch the artist studio practices themselves, because if you can get a bead on where they're going, that's really what matters. And that's where you're going to be able to see it most clearly. 
the other stuff is is still figuring it out. You know, what I mean, I feel like the museums are just now figuring out how to do what they're doing, and now they're actually getting a chance to reopen. So, I just, you know, I, I think that that's just the normal way of it. But, but, I, and I and I think that you know, responding to all these things, the pandemic and all the stuff that we've gone through, that's going to be a part of the way the culture is reflected. And at the same time, there's another part of it, you know, which which we've also talked about, and I think we need to always be be smart about, mm-hmm. which is, hey, when things are this chaotic and we're going to sort of start reimagining everything, it's like, well, what, uh, let's reimagine the the uh, you know how fragile uh, these artists careers can be when something like this goes down, and maybe going forward, you know, the old fifty fifty between the artist and the gallery. Does that stay the same or does the artist get more now or does the gallery get more now or do we I've been looking a lot into a lot of digital things and regarding like cryptocurrency with art and all this kind of stuff. And it's like in on the blockchains, they're figuring out ways to make it so that an artist could potentially sell a piece of work. Um, and then also could potentially continue to make money as that work is resold. Mm-hmm. That's one of the big questions of what's going on right now is, you know, uh, Joe Nolan makes a painting, sells it to Bill Smith. 20 years later, it's worth $10 million, of course. <laughs> and now Bill Smith sells it for $10 million. And Joe still only got, the guy who created it only got the original $500 to begin with. Yeah. Now there's, there's ways you can talk about economics and say, well, that's just the way that goes. Da, 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 da. But there's also other people who would argue that, that, you know, uh, the, the guy, the person who created that deserves a piece of that $10 million sale 10 years down the road. You know what I mean? And, and blockchain technology is one way that you can sort of track and also guarantee and document that that sort of uh financial you know sort of uh um uh compensation for artists you know what i mean and that could be done with anything with a visual work of art with a uh a, a, an mp3 with a wave file with a an mp4 whatever you got you know what i mean so uh so th- th- i think that's one of the things i'm interested in too is uh, you know, how can artists as workers, you know, and as, you know, uh, independent uh, creators and producers and whatnot, how can we find ways to re-engage with the art world after this comes out in a way that empowers us more, you know, regardless of everything else, regardless of what we're going to talk about, regardless of, of, you know, where we're coming from in our individual practices or whatever, just in general, how do artists come out of this better off than they were before versus even more disempowered by the machine. You know what I mean? Wow. That, that's, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot <laughs> in all that. I mean, that's almost like another topic unto itself because like attribution and connection to your work uh, in perpetuity through any means changes yeah. entirely the game. I, I wanted to pull up the, uh, the gallery association association, virtual art call so people could get a sense of yeah uh, what this looks like. I don't want to abandon our, yeah. our mostly this audio audience, but this- this, you know, to people who can see this right now, what we're looking at here is a show that was at uh, uh, Channel to Channel Gallery, which is a gallery in uh, with the Wedgwood Houston neighborhood of Nashville. This uh, piece right here is actually from our friend Omari Booker. This was from a show he did called Redline. I don't know if this is still the red. This isn't just the Redline show, but that was a piece of Omari's. And we actually had Omari on the show formerly. Uh, I was talking to Omari earlier this week, actually. He's in, he's been in Los Angeles for a little bit, uh, making some connections there. But uh, Omari has been on my mind recently. He may be uh, he may be he may be coming up in the local media here in Nashville soon. So keep your eyes peeled for that. That sounds like but, that uh, sounds like you know something, Joe. I know it I know something. Like you know some things. I know some things. I know some things. Well. I mean, if I ever, if I ever, if I ever make, if if they ever make a movie about a uh, young, uh, a young, a very young, handsome uh, art critic, <laughs> they should have a. Uh, I want like I want you know the equally young like Robert De Niro to play me. <laughs> <laughs> I know some things. It's, it's amazing how layered your fantasy world is, right? It's like <laughs> I need a time traveling. Oh, it's De layered, Niro. baby. <laughs> it's layered. I got layers on layers over here in this pandemic, baby. Well, <laughs> uh, well. So to sort of wrap up the, this, our, our sort of art half of the the, the yeah, show here. Good job. We're almost right on time. Yeah, buddy. right. Well so I just wanted to kind of, and I, I do. I'm not even paying attention. To I do here. want people to sort of get a sense of, uh, like, get to these these uh, these videos because they're they're actually really well put together, and in a lot of ways, they provide yeah. a more personal way of getting through things without having to deal with, uh, you know. Yeah. And if you, if you go artists. to the, uh, 
you go to YouTube, it's the National, I mean, Nashville Art, Nashville Gallery Association. Look up their channel and you'll, and that's all you'll find there really is they, they, they never used their channel before they started doing these videos, I don't think. So uh, if, if you're curious at all and you want to see it, it's actually been fun because, you know, again, I, I keep on whining and complaining about the fact that this sort of digital presentation of an art exhibition just doesn't really do the trick in terms of emulating what it's actually like to be there. Yeah. I mean, it sort of does, but not really even close. Yeah. It's really bad. It's a really pale imitation. Um, uh, that said, one thing I've recently realized was uh, you, they, you just showed uh, Ashley Lineker, who's a uh, um, she's uh, 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 one of the gallerists at the Red Arrow Gallery that I've that I uh, am represented by, and that you've actually done a show at Red Arrow with me, Brian. Yeah. And uh, Ashley's there talking about it. I think I can't remember what show that is. I think that might be uh, Jody Hayes' show. Uh, um, uh, I recently had a painting in a show and shared it with my mother and my father-in-law who's also actually a painter and it turned out to be a real fun uh, this actually might be the show it turned out to be a really fun um uh thing to do because like in normal circumstances that again it's one of those things where it's like the digital thing for some people who live in Arizona or who uh, like my mother lives up in Michigan still, it's like, they're not going to make it down to see my art show necessarily. Maybe yeah. they could, but chances are they're not going to come down, you know? So, so it's actually a fun thing that even though it sucks that we can't go to the show in person, it's rad that we can share it with anybody anywhere. You know what I mean? So, right. So one it's, thing, it's one thing's you know, less, one thing's more, one thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, come I, on, you know, but I will say too, like that there's, I, I don't know. I, I feel like that there's a, there's a massive opportunity to, I mean, right now, obviously the, the, the challenge of trying to cover an entire art crawl with video and something that people will actually be able to watch and not become so overwhelmed by, I mean, and to create an experience, you're creating the pace and the experience and they'll, they'll do sort of like survey shots and then kind of get in closer, show you detail, yeah. uh, sometimes, you know, get some context from an artist and all that. I mean, it's, it's really fantastic, but I mean, I feel like that it's almost like that's a discipline unto itself or a practice unto itself for sure that has just been forced to happen right now that I right. think, I think there's a, there's a world of possibilities kind of in that from a, not a production standpoint, but just like from a, uh, like it's one thing to just be trying to cover your ass to get people to still see what's going on in the gallery and like, let's get them some video cause they can't come here. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to actually be like, uh, you know, coming from a place of, I'm going to create a guided experience. You yeah. Know? I mean, it's a uh, filmmaking exercise. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. Unbelievable. So, yeah. And I think, and again, I think some people have done it better than others. You know, Mar our, our friend Marlos Ivan, who's been on the show, he, uh, he had a show of um, uh, a bunch of t-shirts he had painted that were uh, at Julia Martin gallery back in June. Um, and, uh, I've been thinking about those too, Marlos. I've been thinking about those shirts recently this week. Keep your eyes, keep your eyes peeled, Marlos. I know some things about them. So, um, uh, so the, those, uh, the, the, in, in June, there was a virtual art crawl video. And when they got to Julia's segment with Marlos's t-shirts, it was like, it was just all of a sudden the whole thing just amped way up and they, they had basically made a music video essentially. And it was like, <laughs> it was so cool. I mean, it was, it was such a rad fun thing to see and it, it it's, and it stuck out in the best possible way amidst, you know, the, you know, other things of like, here's the art on the wall and here's like somebody commenting about it, which is also cool and can be done very well. But, but, but it was very creative. It was one of those things where it's like, let the artist come up with a cool way to do this that's what they do you know what i mean let the creative people be creative yeah we shirt. we're gonna have a shirt on the art, art fight podcast site let the creative people be creative <laughs> maybe not we'll see it's, we'll think it, about it that's the endless challenge right there we but, do have these well, though don't we brian people can get yeah. cups if they want them don't yeah, they? yeah i'm gonna plug the cup real quick man look at it's that. a fine mug it's a fine mug i've drank many a, many a coffee <laughs> out of this mug so so uh you know i think the, the 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 term that uh the last thing about this is you know okay, he, when yeah. he's he talked about it like you know he called it the machine you know that who's that's he uh, the article the oh the, yeah the opinion piece uh, right yeah 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 and we'll link to that in our a bear you know, herbert stuff. yeah uh, it might be a bear i'm not sure yeah so uh martini bear martini bear <laughs> so so I, 
that there's a, you know there's a presupposition with that right like it's 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 a fixed system it doesn't have room to right. you know sort of operate on substitutes or make quick quick adjustments and there's a bunch of self or uh, there's a bunch of dependent uh systems inside the system you know right and, be, I, and so i think that um uh, you know maybe that is uh, a way of sort of uh, you you could almost look at it from a perspective of if you just zoom really far out in terms of time, this is all still part of the same machine. You know, like this is we've yeah. been here before, like in the way that you've talked about it, like, you know, saying like, OK, so what's new here exactly? Like what? Right. What, stop saying unprecedented times. You know, yeah, we did this 100 years ago. Here we are again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. right around the time that modernism came to America also came the uh, Spanish flu pandemic. So. We welcome it. We welcome it. Right. <laughs> right. And we can't speak to cause or uh, yeah. ca causation. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, all right. Great. Well, so that concludes that our fantastic. segment there on, on all. Thank you, everyone. Things. That was really quite a, <laughs> quite a segment. It was, though. Quite I mean, segment. It's, it's hard not to meander when you're talking about something so big. But I think that at the end of the day, uh, I'm going to be interested to see what shakes out on the other side. And I think a lot of really uh dynamic and nimble shit is gonna is gonna happen if it's not already so uh speaking of dynamic and nimble mm -hmm. let's move on yeah so i wanted to talk about in our in our fight segment here i wanted to talk about frankie edgar and robbie lawler and i think you 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 made some uh comments on on like one of your twitter posts or something and it was interesting because your take on like the connection between those two guys was a, a little bit more nuanced and complex and perhaps more interesting than mine i was just sort of bringing up the idea of talking about both these guys because of the fact that you know frankie edgar kind of pulled off the impossible last week when uh you know he's a, a storied veteran who's pushing 40 who went down a weight class and and won a fight that many people said he, that he didn't have a chance to win. And now, yeah. because partly because of his performance in that fight, but also partly because of the fact that he's Frankie Edgar, this this you know UFC legend, um, people are now saying that he could be one fight away from a title contender, uh, a title contention fight, uh, you know, uh, at, at his new weight class. Yeah. Um, and now this week we've got Robbie Lawler coming up. Robbie is on a three fight losing streak, I believe. Although that's a little controversial in terms of like how much that means to Robbie Lawler in terms of the way those losses have happened. He's had some bad knockouts, but he's also, you know, kind of maybe didn't get submitted in a fight, you know, and it was a, just a, a rough call by the referee and a great response from Robbie, by the way, when that controversial, uh, uh, yeah. stoppage happened. Yeah. Um, but 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 Robbie also is a guy who has seen more than one sort of like peak in his career. And the question is, does is Robbie Lawler going to pull a Frankie Edgar or is Robbie Lawler, you know, sort of, you know, looking at the 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 end of a storied career in these next couple fights that he may or may not be having? Yeah, well, uh, so just wherever you want to go with any of that. No, I've, well, so the thing is, is that, uh, you know, so we've got there's a few things going on here. So. Uh, number one, we have just the issue, not the issue, but the, the, uh, sort of the, the contrast, I think of, of these two, right? Like it's, it's something where there's, you, you've, you, they both have a, uh, I know we're not doing a comparison contrast, but I think it's interesting that you, you wanted to talk about these two in particular, because they are, uh, in these various stages of, uh, just incredibly lasting durability, uh, and, you know, but with, with the issues, right? Like with some problems and with some challenges too, you know what I mean? Like it's not been, uh, you know, for on the Frankie Edgar side, he's, he's got a, you know, sort of this weight cut that he's, he's making and, and a new commitment to a weight class that we don't know if he's going to be able to sustain or not. And then on the flip side, you've got Robbie Lawler coming back, what this Saturday, right? So, uh, on a few couple weeks notice and fighting Neil Magny and not really sure what he's doing right he's just yeah, it is late notice i forgot about that he's like i'm just here to compete that's all i'm trying to do here so uh you know i find the whole thing to be kind of fascinating because it's like these people are inspiring to me you know it's it, if if i feel like i am uh stuck or feeling old or feeling tired or feeling which happens a lot joe um then uh, I think I get in, this is part of, you know, when artists or people say, why are you into the fight game? And what's so interesting to you about that? Um, well, you know, to me, it's like, uh, 
these people are so inspirational doing really heady, difficult stuff. So with both of them, Frank Yeager, amazing win, I mean, a little controversial, right? But he got it. And then now he's yeah, a close fight, you know, immediately reintroduced to this kind of viability as a champion again, which is just wild. And then, uh, on the other side of it, uh, Lawler, I think is, he lost his title on, to Woodley in 2018. That sounds right. And, uh, and he's been, you know, sort of spiraling ever since. I think he's one of five in his last, or he's one of his last five since he lost the title. He's lost three in a row. Is that right? Yeah. So I got to look uh, up that. You got to look uh, up that, that his last go to was, sure uh, dog page. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> his, his last fight was with, uh, uh, Colby Covington, which was, uh, and that was a decision loss. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I feel like there's gotta be a way to sort of parallel them, but I also think that in a lot of ways, uh, wow, are they different? Um, Frankie Edgar's fighting style for those who are not familiar. Uh, he's, he's one of the, there's a, there's a handful of people that, that have been in the UFC for a long time that, it's like uh, you just want to see them fight because you're going to be dazzled by footwork and movement. And it's just going to be this obviously poetic uh, exchange and and movement and skill and technical prowess in a way that you don't have to even appreciate the stakes of the fight or know anything about their history. Uh, you're going to see you're going to see somebody like like Frank Edgar fight and, and you're just going to be thinking about a lot of things. You're going to be thinking about wrestling, but you're going to be thinking about dance. You're going to be thinking about uh how how does he what aspects of of his footwork and what he's doing are sort of drilled and kind of unconscious and what things are sort of improvisational and and uh taking in the moment yeah uh, and he's still got uh this durability too i mean he he really well i mean he had to show a little bit of too much of his durability in this last fight but right but yeah, there's a thing too about edgar edgar to me is like a very um I mean, it sounds dumb, but he's a very athletic fighter in the sense that he's very much like a wrestler who's also a boxer, you know, who also has, you know, some of the requisite other, you know, sort of, uh, you know, martial arts, you know, requirements as a grappler and as a kickboxer um, that anybody at the UFC would have. But but there's a very sort of athletic, sort of sportsy sort of, you know, this guy's a professional athlete quality to him, where for me, Robbie, who also is very athletic and has a lot of skill sets himself. But at the end of the day, the real Robbie Lawler magic is that Robbie Lawler is a savage fighter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Robbie Lawler is a fighter. You know, uh, you know, you get the idea that Frankie Frankie Edgar, you know, might have been a good point guard at some point. You know, right. but with but with for, with Lawler, you don't really feel that way. You feel like Lawler's tools are are kind of you know perfectly pointed at the fight game. You know, like that's he's got the he's got the 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 intestinal fortitude of a fighter and then also happens to have the physical power and the and the you know the technical capacities to back that up you know what i mean um and that's why i mean that's why he's a legend you know what i mean i mean some of robbie's fights are some of the best fights i've ever seen you know and uh um uh and just just for the record here just so we're clear he lost his uh championship to woodley in 16 2016 oh sorry yes um, he was K that was a bad KO loss. I think I said he was, there was more than one KO, but that was really the only KO loss. That was a bad KO for him. Um, and that was a bad one as all of Tyrone Woodley's knockouts are bad. Um, we've never seen him kind of knock somebody out. He just fucking drops people into another world. Um, but then he, uh, Lawler did finish that loss up with, or follow it up with a win against Cerrone in 17 and then a loss to Rafael Dos Anjos in 17. And then in 19, he lost to Ben Askren. Again, a very controversial bulldog choke submission where for people who don't understand, basically the referee thought that he'd been choked unconscious. And then Robbie pops his head out and is like, what did, why'd you stop the fight? <laughs> mm -hmm. So maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. It, it can happen where a fighter, you know, can go, uh, unconscious for a moment and then come right back out of it and not know that they were even unconscious for a moment. You know, like it's, it can be that sketchy. Um, yeah. uh, but, 
But nonetheless, anyway, a controversial loss to Ben Askren in March of 2019, and then followed up in August with a, a decision loss against Colby Covington, who, as I, I don't remember that fight that clearly, but what I do remember is Covington just putting that Covington pace on him and, and sort of smothering Robbie with damage because he can just sort of go and uh, against anyone but uh, Usman, Covington just seems to be able to overwhelm people. Yeah, and I think that if you're in, you know, I think a lot of fighters when they get on in their age, they really want to get to the point where they are, um, they're looking for kind of more one one shot knockouts. And yeah, you and know, definitely also like a controlling the pace situation. You know what I mean? Because that's where that's where the you know the these other fighters you know who are younger and and are questing for those first championships and you know and also Covington that's like you know people hate the guy but at the end of the day he's got a gas tank from here to eternity you know what I mean there's I mean it's insane actually so you know so that's Robbie's one of those guys who's not used to getting pushed to the fence and and held there you know what I mean and uh and it's sort of you know your 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 big right hand isn't there necessarily when you're when you can't get your feet underneath you because this maniac won't stop rustling you. You know what I mean? Um, but that said, it's actually interesting. I remember seeing uh, what was the fight that that he had. I was looking over some of Robbie's old fights, and there was that one fight against uh, – who was it against? Uh, I can't – I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. It was a while ago now that I'm looking, but it was uh, – uh, was it – no, hold on. It was a KO win. Uh, I gotta find it, but anyway, it was, it was a, uh, it was a win where, um, Robbie had basically was getting beat up pretty bad and got pushed back to the fence and was in, you know, he was basically in the process of losing a fight. And then at the last second, he just, he basically sort of ducked under and threw like a check right hand and, and just this guy who'd been like, was basically a guy who was about to win the fight because I think it was the third round. Robbie just caught him on the chin and he went down and it, the fight was over. And you remember that it's like, oh, right. Yeah. Robbie Lawler, he'll take you out at any point. You know what I mean? At any yeah. point he can let it go. And, and also too, in, in the right circumstances. And certainly when he was younger, you know, he had wars with people like Rory McDonald, arguably the greatest mixed martial arts fight I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. And that was one of those situations where it's like both those guys just did not, they don't know how to stop. You know what I mean? Uh, Rory, Rory, I wouldn't say that, that uh, I've ever thought of uh, uh, Robbie as, as anything like uh, a newsman or a Covington in the sense of that, just like overwhelming gas tank on people. But in terms of durability, I mean, there's no question about durability when it comes to Robbie, you know, outside of that one fight against Tyron. And even that was a thing of like, you got to knock him out cold if you want him to stop coming forward. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, when you, when you're looking at stuff like this, right? Like this is this, it's, this is when you're when you want to sort of turn somebody on to uh, <laughs> yeah, the beauty don't, of combat sports. Don't show them uh, or, or show them this. There's a certain fan if they saw these just these stills of him and Rory, they'd be like, "I'm sold." And there's other people who'd be like, "I don't ever want to see this." <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, but it, but it it's it's kind of like uh, I've kind of got a I've kind of got like a Rory McDonald thing going on right now. You see this? Yeah. Oh yeah, I like that. I got nice. more. Mine's a little more mullet though. Yeah. I need to get yeah, I need to get that going. So so you know, it's almost like um like when you're a teenager, right? And and you're trying to like turn on some friend of yours to some music that you like or something, but you know that he's a metalhead, you know what I mean? So you're like, oh, yeah. okay, I'm gonna have to find like the heaviest right. <laughs> uh, it's it's prog rock and I wanna I wanna introduce him to the world of prog rock. Right. <laughs> but man, it's gotta be something with a heavy riff to get him in. Right. <laughs> so uh, Rob, Robbie Lawler and, and Roy McDonald is, is like, is sort of like as close to like, uh, Pantera as, as you can, uh, get, you know, it's just in yeah. your face. Uh, yeah. so that was, that'll always be a, a landmark and, you know, Lawler's mouth almost fell off or what, you know, it was, it was pretty yeah. gross. It was pretty gross. So, yeah. uh, without getting into the details of that, you know, I think that, you know, kind of coming back out to sort of looking at Frank Yeager, looking at Robbie Lawler, you know, one of the things that. 
I think is common between them, although Edgar's winding up very quickly in a different place uh, right now, is that they both have this baseline sensibility about them that is made of experience. And, and uh, you know, so, so they have all that sort of underpinning of, of experience, but, but they're both coming from a place of, of very simple, I'm just glad to be here. I'm just glad to be competing. Mm-hmm. I I am not, you know. There's there's some weird Zen thing about it, right? Like when people yeah. are hell bent on, uh, you know, when their ego is attached to the outcome, in some way relative to accolades or championships or whatever. Uh, man, that can just really it's really in. Yeah, it's hard to see. You know, I think. I mean, I think you saw a little bit of that, frankly, when uh, even in even in uh, Daniel Cormier at the end of his career, he really. He really was always a guy who was so dedicated in the last, you know, five years, especially just like so dead set on, you know, my legacy and my legacy yes. and my legacy. And I think, I mean, I, I mean, I think, and I think he would admit this and, and, or has admitted this, you know, especially in his, in his, um, uh, uh, rivalry with John Jones, you know, that he, you know, he had to learn how to let go of a lot of things that he just had no control over and just had yeah. to realize that like, that is a mountain I will never climb. I'm never going to be able to get to the top of that mountain. I tried, I tried, I don't have enough time and it's just not going to happen, you know? And, and again, to his credit, I think you've seen him sort of work through that stuff. Um, but, but there are fighters and I think, yeah, I think both these guys are good examples of that. I mean, I think Robbie's reaction to that early, early stoppage against uh, Ben Askren, you know, as I said, for people listening who maybe maybe haven't seen this, imagine a guy essentially in a in a in a headlock, and the referee thinks he's gone unconscious. And as soon as the, the other fighter lets him go, Robbie immediately <laughs> pops his head up and is saying, "Like what? Why'd you stop the fight?" You know what I mean? And it, as soon as it happened, and there was like a collective just groan across the MMA sphere because everybody was just like, "Oh my God, he wasn't even out." You know what I mean? But it can be hard to tell because you can't even see his head or his eyes or anything. Um, uh, but, but Robbie Lawler's initial reaction was what the hell? Like, why did you stop the fight? And then Im- like immediately on live television, they didn't have to go back and show you this. You watched it happen immediately in live television. He immediately followed that reaction up with, Hey, it's okay. Like, I think he even reaches out and like touches yeah. Herb Dean on the yeah, shoulder yeah. and he's like, Hey man, it's okay. And he completely, and it's even more evidence that he was never unconscious because he was this aware of what was happening, that yeah. he was, he was so aware of it that he actually, you know, overcame his own reaction in the moment to be the bigger man and say, Hey, I totally understand what happened. I'm removing the context from my own self, my career, my win that just got stolen from me. Yeah. And I'm going to reassure this other guy that he did what he had to do and, and he made the best decision he could make. Yeah. That's insane. It's insane that, that, yeah. that he's got that sensibility, but it really does speak to the idea that, and even him coming in like late, you know, uh, you know, this was a situation where you've got a fighter was supposed to fight somebody else. That guy, did he have to cancel because of a COVID situation or why is the other fighter out? I don't remember why, who was going to fight Magni. Do you know? I uh, can't remember now, but yeah, it's some kind of, but story. anyway, yeah. but was it COVID related or was it something else? It doesn't matter, but, yeah, yeah. but know. regardless, uh, you know, the, there was a, uh, uh, you know, a slot on the card and at, in a short notice situation, Robbie Lawler's like, hell I'll fight him. You know what I mean? And to me, that's also indicative of that sort of, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, enact my perfect, precise plan that will get me to the next place, that will get me to the next place, that will yeah. land me on the great throne of the, yeah. of the, you know, the championship title. It's it's a guy who's like, hey, I'm healthy. I need some money. Uh, let's fight. <laughs> yeah. well, I, you know, I, 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 it's amazing how people respond to uh, uh, expectations, whether it's their own or external or the the public perception or whatever it may be because i mean how many times have you seen uh you know these kind of stories that happen you think about like jeremy lynn coming into the nba you know and just tearing it up or you know people that come off the bench and just never get to play and have these amazing you know playoff games or or uh you know i got one name for you rudy yeah right yeah (laughs) it is a true story isn't it so it is a true story yeah so (laughs) But, you know, so I think that there's, I, 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 sometimes I feel I'm all for sort of meritocracy and there does have to be sort of a North star of a championship or something sure. to kind of just guide, I, I think everything, but at the same time, and all, you know, stakes were created because it's prize fighting. Right. Uh, 
and that's what puts butts in seats and all that stuff. But, you know, right. I, I wish that there was sometimes a different tone in the way that things are talked about with some of those uh, types of competitors, because they either talk about it, well, like they're in contention or they're no longer in contention or they might get cut or they might, you know, not, or uh, everything's just about this sort of, how are they progressing through the system as opposed to just taking it for what it is, you know, and then the idea that he's going to fight Magni on a, you know, a few weeks notice when he's, uh, I mean, obviously he's in very good graces with the UFC and he's got a little bit of leverage there historically, but three fight skid, I mean, on for most people, that means this is a do or die must win or whatever you want to call it. Uh, or I'm going to be out of the best promotion. And then what am I doing at that point? Which brings me to my next sort of comment, which is basically just to say that these people that are like, oh, I'm going to go to Bellator. I'm going to go to one. I'm going to go do these different things. Uh, it's, it's weird that people have a hierarchy assigned to it. I, I can appreciate that it's fact on some level, like the best talent kind of goes to certain places. But I mean, it's not empirical and it's it, there's so much to learn and so many insights to be had from seeing people just in different contexts, in different situations, doing different things with a different sort of uh, set of competitors to to battle with or to go up against or to yeah. uh, to show in a different type of relief or, or contrast. So I don't know. I, I hope that Lawler wins because I, I don't want him to be that many down, you know, in, uh, in a right. row, but, uh, yeah, you don't, you don't want that for anybody and you don't want him to take yeah. any damage. Right. But, um, yeah, I think, I think he will win. I've got a feeling that that Lawler will win this fight on Saturday. So you heard it here first folks. I also want a really quick shout out to our friend, Paul, who's uh, chatting with us as we're doing this. Mm. I'm not sure what, what, uh, what platform he's on Brian, but, uh, but he, he rightly guessed that my, uh, my repeating the phrase, I heard some things over and over again is actually a scene from raging bull. Oh, I've got it. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it here. There it is. <laughs> I heard some things. I heard some things. I heard some things. <laughs> it's a great, it's a, it's really a Scorsese thing. It's also a, a very David Mamet thing to just repeat information over and over again. If you want it to sound really, that's what maybe, maybe that's what we need more of. You know, uh, Warhol was really into repetition and maybe just through repetition, the art world will again find deep traction because there's something to be said about the aesthetics of repetition in terms of creating meaning. So, well, uh, the other thing to, is, <laughs> to, to tie back to what we talked about, I suppose, like a couple episodes ago, but we were talking about just sort of, I don't know, like, does everything have to have a cause or is everything have to, has to be, does every art response have to be political or right? You know, or is that a trap? Or is that a, yeah, <laughs> a topical art, right? Um, you know, I feel like the man, that's just going to be something that has to get sorted out for a while. But the good news right. is there are so many people that are calling themselves artists now or are also, in fact, artists that I think that we have enough coverage for generally every notion misguided or, or not. I say this because <laughs> I don't like to trash people, right? I'm not like this. <clears throat> But, but, but <laughs> uh, a friend of mine who's a very accomplished artist who I will remain, who will remain nameless uh, for the sake of this commentary, but he is working on a project right now and being uh, sort of inundated with, um, let's just say a lot of uh, artists that would like to get some of his time uh, to learn things or to share stories or, or whatever. And uh, it's, how can I say this? There's he he described it as he said, you know, this is a phenomenon that I've actually noticed in the American South, which is to say that there are uh, all there's there's a lot of artists, apparently, that are these kind of like in, there's somewhere between Instagram model and also happen to be an artist. But they like they'll pose in front of their canvases. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, just the South. Well, he was just saying that this this particular sort of profile, you know, this like, mm -hmm. you know, sort of in their twenties, now they're an artist. They have no, you know, it doesn't mean you, I don't, I'm not shitting on people that don't have training or background. Right. I'm not one of those people necessarily either, but, uh, but they don't, I mean, they don't really have any actual, like it's really just like a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an art. Being an artist is a, as a, as an article of clothing that they just decided to start wearing. Mm hmm. Uh, and I think you know what I'm talking about. Like without, I know what you're talking about. I just don't know that as a southern thing. I know that as a yeah. dumb human thing. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe more specifically, he was just talking about like, uh, there's just a, there's, there's local a, examples, perhaps there's just, there's <laughs> a lot of, they all sort of seem to paint in the same style, which is weird, but mm. it's, it's, it's always like, not always, but generally it's just this kind of really sort of, uh, I, you know, abstract because whatever. And it's mm -hmm. just like in a color palette to be above your couch and right. nothing, not, you know, decor type of art, nothing wrong right. with that, but it's sure. just, it's, uh, it's just interesting though, because some of it gets really, really sketchy, um, right. And really problematic on some level, but, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds, uh, there's all kinds, but it's you know, true. Uh, which, which, which side are you on? Uh, no, I, I, I'm not really into topical art and I know we covered that, but, um, I just uh, can't take enough cute pictures of myself in front of my art, Brian. Yes. No. <laughs> yeah. When are you, when are you going to do some jean shorts, uh, in front of your, your next work or something? Oh, Joe? Yeah. Come on. It's a good idea. Yeah. It gets your Daisy Dukes out. Uh huh. Yeah. It's, it's about time. Summer's, <laughs> summer's almost over. I got about a month left. Yeah. Hey, well, before uh, before we wrap this up totally, yeah. let me let me let me just throw out a couple of things. If people want, if people are interested, I know that we have a bunch of artists listening to this thing. I just want to throw this out there. There's a new um uh mail art project that's being organized through uh a guy named Jason Brayman in Nashville, uh or I'm sorry, Jason Brown in Nashville um does uh does these various art uh mail art projects he's been doing them for years but during the pandemic of course it's really picked up i was participated in a project he recently did and uh that project ended up getting profiled in time magazine and uh he's he's really done a good job of promoting these shows and really curating these really interesting projects so he's got another one going on that's kind of more based on voting by mail so it's called uh, if you go to instagram and look up at vote mail art v-o-t-e-m-a-i-l-a-r-t um there is an uh, mail art project that you could be a part of and uh uh it's pretty open and democratic and uh, go check it out so i think it's the kind of thing that if you're yeah there you go thank you brian i think if you go to at vote mail art on instagram you can learn more about it and perhaps even participate in this wonderful uh uh mail art uh, exhibition so uh uh that's a fun opportunity for you guys and if you go to uh, the, uh, I guess it, it came up today that yeah, the red arrow gallery, that's the, um, the Instagram for the red arrow gallery in Nashville. They just today posted a picture of the painting I was talking about earlier, uh, a painting I did called the black flag that's up and they've got, they've got my partial artist statement. My artist statement was so insanely long. I had to edit it to put it on Instagram. <laughs> so, so there's, if, if you want the full artist statement, you know, uh, get in my DMS, get in my DMS and I'll hit you with the full artist statement. Um, but you can check out that painting there. Is there anything you want to talk about or plug any projects you have going on, Brian? Well, let's see. No, no, not right now. Um, but I, you know, uh, an update that you're not asking for though, I'll give you is, um, <clears throat> and something I actually would like to kind of get into maybe on another, uh, episode at some point. Um, but, I think that there's something about uh, wood shedding and learning during this time mm -hmm. that has a different sort of sheen and a different importance or, or something right now. I mean, we're all sort of doing that weird prepper kind of thing, right? Everybody's cleaning out the closets <laughs> and all that shit, right? Or whatever. But, uh, but even more, uh, more deeply, uh, you know, so I, I'm working on uh, essentially new uh, for, you know, people don't know maybe what I do, but, uh, I do a lot of maybe film work and drone work and those types of things. I also do a lot of music and soundtracks and, uh, you know, been doing music actually more than probably anything for the last 20 something years, but I've just been sort of in a place where I don't want to deal with a computer anymore, uh, for music. And so I'm kind of going into this, uh, what you would say a DAW-less setup, DAW less, uh, digital audio workstation, less setup. And, hmm. Um, so I've got sort of, you know, I'm sort of getting back, uh, out into sort of sequencing and sampling and things that I was sort of doing in the nineties when I first got started. And there's a, a pleasant, uh, sort of set of constraints and then maybe, uh, limitations, you know, but, uh, in a good way, uh, it's been, it's been really, it's been really awesome and not having screen time equate to, um, uh, creative anything, right? Like I, I, uh -huh. I I'm really happy in the same way that maybe a writer would just enjoy, uh, you know, just writing on paper, right. And not looking at a screen, you know, uh, it may, some may say like, well, that's kind of 
you know, away is strike. So now you're going to transcribe all that and whatever, but it's like, no, no, but like you get stuff out in a different yeah. way. And because you're stuck at a particular pace and you don't have immediate ability to undo everything and redo right. everything and copy paste, whatever, like it forces you into a flow. Uh, uh, and so uh, I've been reworking all of my, my setup in those ways. And it's just been really interesting. And then also I, I was just telling uh, my wife yesterday, you know, I said, She's like, well, you reevaluate all this stuff all the time. I was like, no, no, but you don't understand. Like the level of which I'm going right now is is deeper and more fundamentally a shift than anything I've done since the '90s. You know, mm-hmm. and and, uh, and the other part of it's weird is like when you're in your you know uh, '40s, late '40s, uh, you start to kind of think about your decisions a little bit different. You know what I mean? You start to think about like uh, it's less like I'm going to try this now. It's more like I got to make some decisions about what I'm going to use. This going. could be my last recording. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Like, <laughs> exactly. Like, uh, you, you kind of get to this point where, you're like, this, this, this is kind of starting to get into swan song territory. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I really need to pay attention to what I'm doing and I really want it to be a fruitful, mm. sort of uh, productive, pleasing, right. tactile, satisfying way of working for a long time mm-hmm. and uh it is it is interesting you know but i've done all this with my camera setups i've done all, i've done all this kind of revamping with everything lately and i just i have found that uh, it's very different than say when i was in my 20s right where you're just like man like this is a you know shiny object i'm gonna go try this or i'm gonna you know it's now it's sort of like no i'm just trying to like tie stuff down to the to the to the dock here like i am not Mm-hmm. trying to like uh yeah change the world by uh understanding some new thing that other people don't you know <laughs> like <laughs> yeah 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 i do i'm i'm kind of in a weird space because i'm trying to basically get my get my um audio recording space like up and running in my new house and uh and it's basically been like one of the spaces in the house that's been like i, I i've got a bunch of like recording stuff on that was like in the middle of happening so it's it that you know before the whole shutdown happened or whatever so it hasn't been a huge priority to get that finished but to yeah. the degree that it is a priority that i keep on focusing on little by little just to kind of keep it pushing forward i've had to realize that it's like you know what all this you know gear that i had in storage and all this kind of stuff now that i've got a chance to get it all and play with it again it's sort of like this thing is ancient <laughs> and uh and i can i can upgrade this for pennies now because i can get something <laughs> because right. the cheap thing is still much better than the thing that i've got you know which is the too yeah. old thing at this point because give me specific happened, examples as soon as you well i bought a uh i bought a um uh you again for people who don't know any different you, you need to have an audio interface to uh to get music into your computer to keep it simple okay so you can't plug a mic into your computer so you got to have something to plug a mic into that can plug into your computer but that that piece of equipment is really going to have a huge part in determining the quality of sound that you're going to be able to get into that computer so if you've got a nice mic you want to you want that nice mic sound to get all the way into the computer so that interface is really important and um uh, I can't remember how much I spent on the thing I used to have, but for about a hundred, I think it was less than $150. I got a piece of equipment called a Scarlet 2i2. Uh-huh, um, focus right. Focus right. Yeah. yeah. Focus, focus right basically makes a whole lot of different interfaces. Mm-hmm. And, and that Scarlet 2i2, that's basically, uh, it's the third generation. So it means it's like it's most updated mic preamps, which is basically what, makes that sound quality happen as it goes into the computer. Yep. And this is not for your quite your yeah. your you yeah, yeah, no, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Tell and, me more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. Pre-app. <laughs> <laughs> so um uh and then it's also the it's also that two I two designation is really just about the size of this thing, how many inputs it's got and whatnot. And this is a very small setup that's really just essentially for somebody who's at home mostly making their own music and, or maybe somebody's going to come over to my house on a Saturday and track some guitars or something, you know, but I'm not planning on recording whole drums kits or anything like that in my house. So, so uh, it's a pretty small box, but between that and uh, my new mic the other day, 
I had a recording that was already in process. I don't know if I mentioned this on the show or not, but I've got a new single that's coming out. And one of the things that we wanted to do between my producer's studio at his place, my drummer and his own studio that he has set up with his drums at his place, and then my place, we all sort of did different tweaks and things on this on this older recording that we had to not to really fix it so much, but just to add to it and, yep. and finish it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and one of the things I wanted to do was I, I really felt like I knew for certain that as a singer, I could do a much better performance than the one I had. It's not out yet, Brian, but it will be soon. <laughs> and I'm going to put it out. I think the day after the summer solstice is, is a Tuesday. And so Tuesday is a big day to put your new recordings out. And uh, I love, I love astrological releases. So it'll be late September. The 22nd, I think is the date. Um, uh, um, but uh, that uh, recording uh, I went back and actually cut this this mic that I love that I got my own version of. I've never had my own version of this mic, but it's a mic that I love recording on. I got one for myself to have in my own studio. I have this new you know uh, uh, box going into my computer, this audio interface, um, and it turned out fantastic. And also too, I also learned how to record in that space because I've never tried to record a vocal in that space. Um, but I learned that if I, oh, if I face a certain direction into this corner where the vaulted ceiling of my attic is meeting right. the, the, this carpeted floor in just such a way that all of a sudden you realize that there's no sound, like all the sound just dies <laughs> in that corner. So yeah. I just scream into this corner and this mic does a great job. So, so <laughs> it was really a fun learning experience, but, but anytime that you're dealing with sort of upgrading and, and just trying to put together something, it's, it's kind of the opposite where suddenly you You've got to consider hundreds of options for every budget and category. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, so yeah, it's not like how it used so to be I'm where trying, there was like I'm trying to things. do yeah. Yeah, yeah, you no, know, yeah, exactly. And and uh and also another thing that I've that I've learned, I haven't I haven't stuck to this very well because because there are lots of affordable options out there, frankly, for almost anything that you might need nowadays that are like really good things that don't cost a lot. But I but I saw a video the other day, a guy was talking about I can't remember what what piece of gear he was talking about, but he made the point of saying that when he had gone he was a guy who's probably about our age, maybe even a little bit older, but someone who had been to some kind of recording school or something, you know, and obviously was a pro engineer for many years now. And he was saying that he had gotten some advice from one of his professors years ago. Uh, and the advice was, and this is important, especially because this time of year is the time when it's going to be coming up on the holidays. This is when everybody's going to start coming out with their new gear and all this kind of stuff will be happening. And it's, it's, it's always good to think about this piece of advice, which is buy last year's model because last year's model is probably still a huge upgrade for you being somebody who needs to upgrade after several years of having a piece of equipment, you know, buying last year's model is still going to be a big shiny yeah. new thing to learn and use for you, but yeah. you're going to get it for pennies on the dollar compared to the brand new model that just came out. You know what I mean? So, um, uh, so that's good advice. I, advice that I'm mostly not taking, but, <laughs> um, yeah. but I'm also not, I'm also, again, it's like a thing where that, that focus right box is, about as affordable as it could possibly be. And oh, it's yeah, also, yeah. it's also something that every time I tell somebody, I just got one of these, they're like, Oh my God, you just bought the best thing you could have bought. So, uh, yeah, yeah. so it's just, it's just, it's, 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 it's become a much more affordable thing in general, you know, over the years. Yeah. I mean, you know, God, I, I, I actually, um, I've been on the fence about it, but I, I used to have, I had all the first generation universal audio stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, um, I want to get back into that world because it's the best plugins and the best sound, uh, best preamps for those, you know, it's just, they're just crazy expensive. Um, uh -huh. you know, about sort of like four times, four to eight times as expensive as the focus, right stuff. But, right. but you, but even at the lowest level, you, what happens is you get keys to this kingdom, right? Because mm -hmm. then, then you have access to utilize these, these plugins that are just astounding. And then you can actually have your preamp, you can you can do mic modeling and amp oh, right. modeling, that's awesome. but it's like really good emulation. Like it's mm -hmm. not. Uh, that's a whole know, other world that's become so much better than it used to be. A million times better. I mean, you know, like I think about when I made my first record on a computer. I remember 
this is before they even had DSPs, right? Meaning like real time effects. So what I guess I'm mm -hmm. talking about audience is like, if you want to put an echo or a reverb on a vocal to make it sound more spacious, uh, you would just do that in an analog console and run it through an effect. Or you uh, now you, you would just turn on the reverb in your software and adjust it and, and it'll in real time process it and make changes. So I could be, I could be singing my vocal as I'm recording it and I could hear the reverb going through my head or while I'm mixing, I could be adjusting the reverb. It's all happening in real time. Right. For monitoring and for the recording and everything. Yes. Yeah. So, but, but when I first started DSPs weren't even a thing, right? It was just the, if you wanted to put reverb on a vocal track, you would have to stop everything you're doing and then select the file that you want to put the reverb oh, yeah. on. And then, and then in many cases, you wouldn't even be able to preview. No. Oh, like no. What it would sound like. You're no, just no. guessing. You're like, I think about a, this big of a, a space that I want to emulate yeah. it. And, you know, whatever this, maybe this much, uh, uh, yeah. tail, tail on it or whatever. And then you, you like literally just you'd say, apply. okay, apply. And then it would take, you know, if, if it's a, a 10 minute song or five minute song, whatever, it would take sometimes like 10 or 15 minutes to just render yeah. that. So then you, you'd be like, okay, I'm going to put reverb on a vocal. I don't know what it's going to sound like. I hope it's good. Click render and then go do something else for a while and then come back and see what happened with your, you and, know, it's like, and then just, undo it because it's not right. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You remember, you remember <laughs> like, I'm not going to commit just because I have to. Yeah. Yeah. You just, you just end up with this. Like, yeah, I, I remember just shooting in the dark, man. It's just yeah. like, I think maybe like this, I used to have this, I can't remember what program I was using, but there was a, uh, it, this was like even before pre tool, I mean like pro tools and stuff, but I was using a program where I was trying to use this like plate reverb on it and i would just be like i and it would like it's i got it basically and i was like i was like i mean this is always a good idea with any kind of thing nowadays but but i got really religious about like if i dialed in like a certain kind of reverb or something like for my vocals and things it was just like save this save yeah, that, presets, so that presets, yeah, yeah. so that later on it's like i knew that i could mostly depend i mean that would still yeah. be fucked up because of the mix and whatnot but at yeah. least i knew going into this as long as i didn't mind it having essentially the same you know <laughs> echo effect you know right, yeah. I, I i knew that this would generally work for my thing every time as long as yeah. i was using the same mic and etc cetera, etc cetera. but but yeah those were the days brian nobody yeah. remembers that but yeah, so it's been bonkers. Like now, like what, what I'm getting into now is sort of like it's kind of like I'm into this thing called the Octatrack I was showing you last week or whatever, and it's been out for a while, but it's sort of in its second iteration, and it's kind of like having Ableton Live but in a, a freestanding box, yeah, uh, with the buttons on it. But it's it's one of these things where um, everybody that that uses it, it, there's there's this, it's such a weird, obtuse, strange, hard to learn. You can't just walk up to it and start cooking something on it right like mm -hmm. you have to like even to do some of the most basic things you've really got to wrap your head around how routing works and how uh -huh. uh, how hierarchies are set up and just like it's a crazy it's it feels like that one guy designed it you know what i mean there is never put through like a team right where people are like you can't fucking do that man like yeah. nobody's gonna understand what the fuck that is but what I'm sure that it's not one guy, but it feels like it. Right. Yeah. And, and whoever that guy is, English was not his first language. Yeah. So, that's hilarious. Uh, well, so sounds anyway, like fun. we've gotten really long, of course. Yeah. 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 We'll get do. out of here, man. What is, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, that's what I've been doing. All right. Uh, right on. Get, get us out of here, man. Uh, well, okay. So, uh, we're happy to have everybody here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, I hope you guys enjoy the fights this weekend. Is there a Bellator fight on Friday or just on just the UFC on, on Saturday? Well, um, if you guys, if you guys haven't been keeping up with it, um, I'm sure most of you guys who are interested in fights, follow Robin black. He's our great friend and one of the great inspirations behind the show, but Robin black has been doing these really fun hangs, uh, on Twitter and also on YouTube, I believe, um, yeah. follow at Robin black MMA on Twitter, but he's been doing these really fun hangs, uh, on the nights of the Bellator fights. And it's been, it's been so fun to, uh, just sort of watch the fights with Robin and, um, and uh, you know all the different guests that he's had on. Last week he was he had on uh, uh, Wonder Boy's dad, Coach uh, um, uh, uh, Thompson, and uh, and they started talking about all these different weird martial arts. And at some point they got into some kind of martial art that was strictly kicking. And then I was like 
texting in and saying like, hey, is it anything like savat, which is like a French foot fighting technique? And then all of a sudden I've got like Robin Black and Coach Thompson just going off about French foot fighting and how it originated <laughs> as a game with these sailors and stuff. And I'm yeah. like going, I'm like making dinner, listening to like Wonder Boy's dad talk about French yeah. sailors kicking each other in the shins. And I'm like, <laughs> this is gold. So so you guys, it, when it comes to the Bellator fights, you got to you gotta follow along with those yeah, Robin the next Black one, hangs. The, yeah, September 11th is 2:45. Okay, that's cool. Uh, and then, and then at the end of September, we've got Iggy, uh, uh, Izzy fighting. Is that right? Yeah, that's like so the last fight in the September card. Yeah, we have. Uh, oh, oh, that's gonna be crazy. We have. Let's see, Covington Woodley September 19th. Then yeah, uh, Israel Adesanya versus uh, Paula Costa. Right on Sep- September 26th, UFC 253, and that cool. is going to be. Uh, I don't know. It's like if you if you wanted to see like. It's like it's like Led Zeppelin versus Santana or something like it's just going to be yeah. fucking amazing. <laughs> that sounds good. Hey, um, um, uh, yeah. So so we'll we'll talk about that fight when it comes up. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. next week we'll have a guest next week. I believe it's going to be um, the creator and or creators of a experimental film fest that we have here in Nashville every year. It's going to be virtual this year. It's going to be free. You're going to be able to watch it from anywhere. So no matter who you are, if you're into weird movies. Uh, Tune in next week because I think they'll be our guests. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm hedging my bets because I haven't actually even invited them yet. But mm. it's my plan, and I think they'll be. That's up how we roll. It, so. So, awesome. Uh, yeah. So that's it for this week, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. It's getting dark. It's getting dark here in Tennessee. I know we ran late, see, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, we'll see y'all uh, next Thursday. Have a great weekend. Much love. Peace out. Bye, Peace out, everybody.